Kepler's third law. Again, I did state it that the um, eccentricity of the Earth is very close to zero. Therefore, we are going to assume that the Earth is moving in a circle. So we draw a picture of the sun and the Earth. Look, it's moving in a circle. We are going to figure out stuff about this. We're going to draw a free body diagram of the forces acting on the Earth. Look, there is a force of gravity. Technically, there's also an equal but opposite force of gravity acting on the sun. For the intensive purposes of this class, the sun actually will move around the center of mass of the sun. This is only because the Earth has such a much smaller mass than the sun. The truth of the matter is, is that they will actually move around the center of mass of the two, P, two particle system, which is going to be actually someplace located directly in the sun. For the purposes of this class, however, or at least for the purposes of this particular example, we will we'll go through some where they don't go around the center of mass of one of the two objects. But we're not there yet. So, we're going to start out by summing the forces on the Earth. In what direction are we going to sum the forces in on planet Earth, Vlad? In the up direction. Uh, we are not going to sum them in the up direction. I will try again. I'm sorry, say again? So it's, it's okay. It's also not the y direction. I'll try again. In what direction are we going to sum the forces in on planet Earth, Siddiqui? The in direction. <laughs> if you'll notice, we are we have a circle, right? The Earth is moving in a circle, and this will be true for any planet in orbit around any sun. So we're going to sum the forces in the in direction. We get the force of gravity equals mass times the centripetal acceleration. Uh, on the left hand side, we have the force of gravity, which is going to be big G mass of the Earth times the mass of the sun divided by r squared. Okay, on the right hand side, we have a couple of choices. Uh, Hillary, give me some choices here on the right hand side. Um, you could change the centripetal acceleration into r omega squared. We could change the centripetal acceleration to r into r omega squared. Okay, so we'll do mass times r times omega squared. The mass of what, Mohit? Um, Mass of the Earth. This is the mass of the Earth, because notice this is the um, centripetal acceleration of the Earth, where something the forces on the Earth moving around the Sun here. Okay, so this is the mass of the Earth. Everybody brought the mass, right? Everyone brought which mass? We brought mass of the Earth to the party. Thank <laughs> you. There we go. <laughs> Everyone brought mass of the Earth to the party. <laughs> Take the equitable, we can take the mass of the Earth from everyone. What happens to this r squared? Emma? Um, if you took the r from the other side, it would become r cubed. It would become r cubed. So let's do this. Big G, the mass of the sun, equals r cubed times omega squared. Now, how is it that we know it becomes r cubed? How is it that we know these two r's are the same? Nick, what's the r on the left? So we have the center mass of the sun and the center mass of the earth. The r on the right hand side? It's the uh, radius of the earth from the center of rotation. Notice in this particular case that they are the same. So we do get r cubed there. Uh, let's see. In order to solve for Kepler's third law, so let's do this. Uh, we can then get omega squared equals g times the mass of the sun divided by r cubed because when we're talking about Kepler's third law, we're actually going to be dealing with the angular velocity because Kepler's third law involves the period of the Earth around the sun. Remind me, what is the definition of the period? Kathy? Um, the entire fixed one full cycle. Time for one full cycle. So, angular velocity. The equation for angular velocity is what, Mr. B? Um, it would be velocity over 
Right, and that's actually in terms of the tangential velocity, but that's not what I'm talking about here. This is going back to the, just the basic definition of angular velocity. Oh, okay. Um, what kind of position? What is the symbol we use for angular position? Loki? Theta. Divided by? Change of time. Change of time. So angular velocity, this would be the average angular velocity. All right. Change in theta over change in time. So if the change in time is the period, and the symbol we use for that is a capital P, if the change in time is the period, or I said P, didn't I? Capital T, sorry. Uh, capital T. Um, what then is the change in theta? That's pi rating. So we have 2 pi. So we can now substitute 2 pi divided by the period for the angular velocity. So we get 2 pi divided by the period, that quantity squared. So big G times the mass of the sun divided by r squared equals 4 pi squared divided by the period squared. In other words, the period squared is equal to 4 pi squared times g times the mass of the sun divided by, no, I got it reverse. r is cubed, thank you. So the period squared is going to be equal to 4 pi squared times r cubed all divided by big G divided by the mass of the sun. Now, that is in terms of a circle. Kepler's third law is actually in terms of an ellipse. So rather than having r squared, what we use instead is, a, I'm sorry, instead of r cubed, instead of that, we have a. So this is 4 pi squared divided by big G, the mass of the sun, divided or multiplied by a cubed. That is Kepler's third law. Notice that 4 pi squared divided by big G times the mass are all constants. They're all just numbers. So the period is actually related to the radius of the orbit by just the constants and that really is just the mass of the object in which it's in orbit around. That is Kepler's third law. Please notice this is not on your equation sheet. Please do not memorize it. And I will tell you why. There is, I, I have yet to come across a multiple choice problem where all you have to do is use um, Kepler's third law. Usually what you have to do is you end up having to derive it in some fashion, and they rarely have you simply use the period and figure out the radius or vice versa. You always actually have to go through and solve something more interesting than that. So really, it's just a simple derivation. You sum the forces in the indirection, and you remember the angular velocity equals change in theta over change in time. Note, we could have done this as well using the velocity equals the change in position over change in time, where if this is the tangential velocity, the change in position is going to be 2 pi r divided by the time, which is the period. And rather, rather than using um, r omega squared, you use r, time, r tangential velocity squared divided by the radius. Both give you the exact same thing in the end. What happened to the r cube? From here to here, you mean? Yeah. Oh. The, ra the radius, we assumed it was a circle. A is simply an ellipse. That's the subtle distinction. 